The IBM 1620 was announced by IBM on October 21, 1959, and marketed as an inexpensive, scientific computer. After a total production of about 2,000 machines, it was withdrawn on November 19, 1970. Modified versions of the 1620 were used as the CPU of the IBM 1710 and IBM 1720 industrial process control systems, being variable word length decimal, as opposed to fixed word length pure binary, made it an especially attractive first computer to learn on, and hundreds of thousands of students had their first experiences with the computer on. The IBM 1620 Core memory cycle times were 20 microseconds for the Model I, 10 microseconds for the Model II. Many in the user community recall the 1620 being referred to as cadet, jokingly meaning, can't add, doesn't even try, referring to the use of addition tables in memory rather than dedicated addition circuitry. For an explanation of all three known interpretations of the machine's code name, see the section on the machine's development history. The 1620 architecture. It was a variable, word, length decimal computer with a memory that could hold anything from 20,000 to 60,000 decimal digits increasing in 20,000 decimal digit increments. Memory was accessed two decimal digits at the same time. CFH421 The flag bit had several uses. In the least significant digit it was set to indicate a negative number. It was set to mark the most significant digit of a number. In the least significant digit of five-digit addresses it was set for indirect addressing. Multi-level indirection could be used. In the middle three digits of five-digit addresses they were set to select one of seven index registers. In addition to the valid BCD digit values there were three special digit values. CFH 4211010 record mark chapter 1100 numeric blank 1111 group mark instructions were fixed length, consisting of a two-digit opcode, a five-digit P address, and a five-digit Q address. Some instructions, such as the B instruction, only used the P address and later smart assemblers included a B7 instruction that generated an seven-digit branch instruction. Fixed point data words could be any size from two decimal digits up to all of memory not used for other purposes. Floating point data words could be any size from four decimal digits up to 102 decimal digits. The machine had no programmer accessible registers. All operations were memory to memory. Character and opcodes The table below lists alphameric mode characters. The table below lists numeric mode characters. Invalid character The model I used the Cyrillic character on the typewriter as a general purpose invalid character with correct parity. In some 1620 installations it was called a SMERSH, as used in the James Bond novels that had become popular in the late 1960s. The Model 2 used a new character as a general purpose invalid character with correct parity. Architectural difficulties Although the IBM 1620's architecture was very popular in the scientific and engineering community, Computer scientist Edsger Dijkstra pointed out several flaws in its design in EWD 37, a review of the IBM 1620 data processing system. Among these are that the machine's branch and transmit instruction together with branch back allow a grand total of one level of nested subroutine call, forcing the programmer of any code with more than one level to decide where the use of this feature would be most effective. He also showed how the machine's paper tape reading support could not properly read tapes containing record marks. Since record marks are used to terminate the character's read and storage, most 1620 installations use the more convenient punched card input output rather than paper tape. The successor to the 1620, the IBM 1130 was based on a totally different 16-bit binary architecture software. IBM supplied the following software for the 1620. 1620 Symbolic Programming System, Fortran, 
Fortran 2 required 40,000 digits or more of memory. GOTRAN simplified interpreted version of Fortran for load and go operation. Monitor Iron Monitor 2 disk operating systems. The monitors provide a disk-based versions of 1620 SPS IID, Fortran IID as well as of DUP. Both monitor systems required 20,000 digits or more of memory and one or more 1311 disk drives. A collection of IBM 1620 related manuals in PDF format exists at operating procedures. The operating system for the computer constituted the operator, who would use controls on the computer console, which consisted of a front panel and typewriter, to load programs from the available bulk storage media such as decks of punched cards or rolls of paper tape that were kept in cabinets nearby. Later, the Model 1311 disk storage device attached to the computer enabled a reduction in the fetch and carry of card decks or paper tape rolls and a simple monitor operating system could be loaded to help in selecting what to load from disk. A standard preliminary was to clear the computer memory of any previous user's detritus, being magnetic cores. The memory retained its last state even if the power had been switched off. This was affected by using the console facilities to load a simple computer program via typing its machine code at the console typewriter, running it, and stopping it. This was not challenging as only one instruction was needed such as 160 billion 1 million loaded at address 0 and following. This meant transmit field immediate to address 00010 the immediate constant field having the value 00000 decrementing source and destination addresses until such time as a digit with a flag was copied. This was the normal machine code means of copying a constant of up to five digits. The digit string was addressed at its low order end and extended through lower addresses until her digit with a flag marked its end. But for this instruction, no flag would ever be found because the source digits had shortly before been overwritten by digits lacking a flag. Thus, the operation would roll around memory filling it with all zeros until the operator grew tired of watching the roiling of the indicator lights, and pressed the instant stop single cycle execute button. Each 20,000 digit module of memory took just under one second to clear. On the 1622 this instruction would not work. Instead there was a button on the console called Modify which when pressed together with the Check Reset button, when the computer was in manual mode, would set the computer in a mode that would clear all of memory in a tenth of one second regardless of how much memory you had when you pressed Start. It also stopped automatically when memory was cleared, instead of requiring the operator to stop it. Other than typing machine code at the console, a program could be loaded via either the paper tape reader, the card reader, or any disk drive. Loading from either tape or disk required first typing the bootstrap routine on the console typewriter. The card reader made things easier because it had a special load button to signify that the first card was to be read into the computer's memory and executed. This is the bootstrap process that gets into the computer just enough code to read in the rest of the code that constitutes the loader that will read in and execute the desired program. Programs were prepared ahead of time, offline, on paper tape or punched cards. But usually the programmers were allowed to run the programs personally, hands-on, instead of submitting them to operators as was the case with mainframe computers at that time. And the console typewriter allowed entering data and getting output in an interactive fashion, instead of just getting the normal printed output from a blind bat run on a prepackaged data set. As well, there were four program switches on the console whose state a running program could test and so have its behavior directed by its user. The computer operator could also stop a running program then investigate or modify the contents of memory. Being decimal-based this was quite easy, even floating point numbers could be read at a glance. Execution could then be resumed from any desired point. 
Aside from debugging, scientific programming is typically exploratory. By contrast to commercial data processing where the same work is repeated on a regular schedule. Console for details of console lights, switches, and procedures see the respective articles on the IBM 1620 Model I or IBM 1620 Model II. The most important items on the 1620s console were a pair of buttons labeled insert and release, and the electric typewriter. Insert, pressing this key with the computer in manual mode reset the program counter to zero, switched the computer into automatic and insert modes, and simulated the execution of a read numeric from typewriter to address zero. Note, unlike a real read numeric from typewriter, insert mode would force a release after 100 digits had been typed to prevent overwriting the arithmetic tables. Release. Pressing this key while doing a read from the typewriter terminated the read, switched the computer into manual mode, and locked the typewriter keyboard. The typewriter is used for operator input, output both as the main console control of the computer and for program controlled input, output. Later models of the typewriter had a special key marked RS that combined the functions of the console release and start buttons. Note, several keys on the typewriter did not generate input characters, these included tab and return. The next most important items on the 1620s console were the buttons labeled start, stop Z, and instant stop SE. Start, pressing this key with the computer in manual mode switch the computer to automatic mode. Stop Z, pressing this key with the computer in automatic mode switch the computer to manual mode when the currently executing instruction completes. Pressing this key with the computer in manual mode switch the computer into automatic mode for one instruction. Instant stop SCE, pressing this key with the computer in automatic mode switch the computer into automatic manual mode at the end of the current memory cycle. Pressing this key with the computer in manual or automatic manual mode switch the computer into automatic manual mode and executed one memory cycle. For program debugging there were the buttons labeled save and display ma. Save. Pressing this key with the computer in manual mode saved the program counter into another register in the Mars core memory and activated save mode. When a branch back instruction was executed in save mode, it copied the saved value back to the program counter and deactivated save mode. This was used during debugging to remember where the program had been stopped to allow it to be resumed after the debugging instructions that the operator had typed on the typewriter had finished. Note, the Mars register used to save the program counter in was also used by the multiply instruction. So this instruction and the save mode were incompatible. However, there was no need to use multiply in debugging code, so this was not considered to be a problem. Display Mar. Pressing this key with the computer in manual mode displayed the selected Mars register and the contents of the memory at that address. On the console lamps, Paper tape reader punch the 1621 tape reader and 1624 tape punch controls. Power switch with this switch on the reader is powered anytime the 1620 is powered. Real strip switch this switch selects whether reels or strips of paper tape are used. Real power key applies power to the supply and take up reels to position the tape for reading and places the reader in ready state. Non-process runout key feeds tape until the reader is empty and takes the reader out of ready state. Card reader punch The 1622 card reader punch controls were divided into three groups. Three punch control rocker switches, six buttons, and two reader control rocker switches. Punch rocker switches. Punch off punch on This rocker turned the punch mechanism off or on. Select no stop, select stop, this rocker selected if mispunched cards let the punch continue or caused a check stop. Non-process run out, this rocker with the punch hopper empty, run out, remaining cards from the punch mechanism. Buttons, 
start punch, pressing this key with the punch idle and on, started the punch. The computer could now punch cards. Stop punch, pressing this key with the punch active, stopped the punch. Check reset, pressing this key reset all, error check, conditions in the reader and punch. Load, pressing this key with the reader idle and on and the computer in manual mode started the reader, reset the program counter to zero. Read one card into the reader's buffer and checked the card for errors and simulated the execution of a read numeric from card reader to address zero, then switched the computer into automatic mode. Stop reader, pressing this key with the reader active, stopped the reader. Start reader, pressing this key with the reader idle and on. Started the reader and read one card into the reader's buffer and checked the card for errors. The computer could now read cards. Reader rocker switches. Non-process run out, this rocker with the read hopper empty, run out, remaining cards from the reader mechanism. Reader off, reader on, this rocker turned the reader mechanism off or on. Disk drives the 1311 disk drive controls. Module light, this light shows the drive number. When it lights the drive is ready for access. Compare disable key switch when this switch is in the on position and the write address button is pressed a full track write may be performed without comparing addresses used to format disk packs. Select lock light when this lights one or more of the drives has malfunctioned. No disk access can be performed. Write address button light this key controls writing sector addresses. Pressing it toggles this enable and turns its light on off. Enable Disable Toggle Switch This switch enables or disables access to the drive. If this switch is disabled on the master, all drives are disabled regardless of the state of their own switches. Also controls the disk usage time meter. Start Stop button Pressing this key starts or stops the disk drive motor. The motor must be stopped to open the lid and change disk packs. General The Fortran 2 compiler and SPS assembler were somewhat cumbersome to use by modern standards, however, with repetition, the procedure soon became automatic and you no longer thought about the details involved. GOTRAN was much simpler to use, as it directly produced an executable in memory. However it was not a complete Fortran implementation. To improve this various third-party Fortran compilers were developed. One of these was developed by Bob Richardson, a programmer at Rice University, the flag compiler. Once the flag deck had been loaded, all that was needed was to load the source deck to get directly to the output deck. Flag stayed in memory, so it was immediately ready to accept the next source deck. This was particularly convenient for dealing with many small jobs. For instance, at Auckland University a batch job processor for student assignments chugged through a class lot rather faster than the later IBM 1130 did with its disk-based system. The compiler remained in memory, and the student's program had its chance in the remaining memory to succeed or fail, though a bad failure might disrupt the resident compiler. Later, disk storage devices were introduced, removing the need for working storage on card decks. The various decks of cards constituting the compiler and loader no longer need be fetched from their cabinets but could be stored on disk and loaded, under the control of a simple disk-based operating system. A lot of activity becomes less visible, but still goes on. Since the punch side of the card reader punch didn't edge print the characters across the top of the cards, one had to take any output decks over to a separate machine, typically an IBM 557 alphabetic interpreter, that read each card and printed its contents along the top. Listings were usually generated by punching a listing deck and using an IBM 407 accounting machine to print the deck.